folks, welcome back to the shop. Today, we're going to be looking at some basic antenna design in the real world to try and get a few rules of thumb as to the effects different changes have on an antenna's performance. I recently made a dipole, which had some very strange characteristics and didn't perform well as an antenna, even though it was cut to the correct length. After searching around the internet, I was not able to fully understand what happens when specific parts of an antenna design changes. So let's get right into it and talk about the testing setup. We are going to focus on three variables and log the results with SWR and a Smith chart to identify antenna performance sweeping roughly 100 MHz frequency from 350 MHz to 450 MHz. But more on that when we get to the vector network analyzer. Fun new toys in the shop. We are going to take a look at feed line length in the first set of tests. We'll try one half, one third, and one quarter lambda lengths for our frequency, which should be around the high 300s. There have been a lot of talk on several forums and some old snippets from ham radio magazines, but nothing I've seen concrete evidence for. But at one half lambda, there is a magic that can supposedly occur to reduce the effects of impedance matching. We'll see if this is true. We are also going to look at the distance between the elements. This is a quirk that came up with the original antenna, where I found the resistance changed significantly as this distance changes. I'd like to understand more about this effect and how it affects other parts of the antenna. We are also going to look at the total length of the elements, tip to tip, including the distance between the two separated elements. This is the typical way of tuning an antenna, where you'd leave the elements long and trim them down to a specific frequency target. We, of course, want to tweak this as well. Lastly, we are going to change the diameter of the elements. We have an assortment of conductive things to try, so let's give 22 gauge wire, 14 gauge wire, some 4 gauge welding wire, and a 5 8 inch OD copper pipe a try through each of these sets of tests. Enough talking, we need to make some chips, so let's go make the test rig. had a bit of a mishap on the shape Oko. I've been doing lots of cutting in MDF and solid hardwoods, so I might have overestimated the ability of plywood to stay stuck together. As we saw, the small risers got all chewed up by the milling process and my aggressive tool paths, I guess one tenth of an inch is a bit too much. So decided to drill out some pockets, head off to the local hardware store and pick up a dowel. That way the antenna will be raised several inches off the test bench and not just half an inch. So let's go make that happen.
Our test rig is assembled, and I ran through an entire string of tests, but all the footage for the VNA came out looking like this. Most unfortunate. In addition, there were some more issues with the VNA calibration, and further issues even with a camera battery dying and then losing some of the test results. One thing was clear though, that the feed wire length performs best at one half lambda, and all the other variants performed poorly. So moving forward, we're not going to be changing the feed wire length from roughly half a lambda. With the proper camera set up now, configuring the VNA, we'll start that by defining the start and end frequency ranges, in this case 350MHz and 450MHz. Moving on to the calibration, We'll let the device crunch some numbers and create offsets for each point in the defined frequency range, on the open, short, and load calibration devices. Thankfully, these came with the VNA, as even aftermarket load cells can be quite expensive. With the VNA calibrated, and the camera issues sorted out, let's get back to testing. In run number one and number two, we'll be testing the total length of the antenna, and constraining all the other variables. We're using a 20 gauge stranded wire soldered directly onto the active and shield of the coax, and held with masking tape onto the test rig. We're starting out roughly one and a half inches above the calculated total distance for a 433 MHz antenna, and we'll start cutting off roughly one half inch from the entire antenna length between each test. As expected initially, our resonant frequency is a little too low, in the low 350s, tests 1 and 2. But near test number 6, we have a decent SWR of 1.33, and a good impedance of around 48 ohms. Cutting off more makes the antenna perform worse, and way above our target frequency. But let's not dwell on specific frequencies too much, and just focus on the shape of the SWR curve, how steep the walls around the well are, lower is better, and how well matched to 50 ohms it is at that point in the SWR chart. In run number two, we are using a new length of wire, but duplicating the test, so we can at least identify outliers in the data, from me soldering it improperly or any other oddities of the world. If you want to take a look at these in more detail, check out the Google spreadsheet in the description below. In run 3 and 4, we'll be testing the total length of the antenna again, and constraining all other variables. We're going to be using a 14 gauge stranded wire this time, and held with the same masking tape on the test rig. In run number 3, we have a significant change from our previous tests. Although the physical dimensions are similar, the impedance matching and SWR are significantly better with a larger conductor. Let's see if this continues with even larger conductors. Around test number 5, which is roughly one half inch lower than the calculated antenna length, we have an SWR of 1.3, and a very wide frequency range of 380MHz to 420MHz. In run number 4, we're soldering new wires again just to double check our results. There were no obvious outliers, and there are direct comparisons in the spreadsheet in the description below.
Preparing for runs 5 and 6, we'll be stepping up to a number 4 gauge wire. This is a high strand count welding wire, and it required getting the soldering gun out as my poor little Akko couldn't dump enough heat into this huge conductor. In test number 1, number 2, and number 3, we can see that as the conductor size goes up, our resistance goes up a little bit as well. I think this may be because the distance between these conductors is so small it's creating a little bit of a coupling, like an in-air capacitor of sorts, which has resistance at RF frequencies. The large conductors are also behaving much more predictably on the Smith chart. The first 22 gauge wire had a huge loop and a steep SWR curve. Moving to the 14 gauge wire reduced the swirl on the Smith chart, but the number 4 gauge wire is predictable and even way out of its tuned range, all the way down to the 350 MHz band, and all the way up to 450. We have an SWR of 4, where the previous antennas had SWRs in excess of 10. In run number 6, we're connecting the same coax up to a new set of wires and running the tests again, just as we had before. With a large conductor, the run-to-run -run variance seems to go down as well. The previous antennas had more drift between the runs when compared test to test. Using this number 4 gauge welding wire is not great though due to cost and weight, so let's continue looking for better options. Preparing for run number 7, and we're going to find some copper pipe with a 5 8 inch outer diameter and cut it down to our proper lengths. Soldering onto this also required the use of the soldering gun, not just the small hacko. I hear the new all-in-one style soldering stations perform wonderfully for huge copper heatsinks like this, but my hobby budget is currently strained. Run number 7 especially in tests 5 and 6, are showing spectacular breadth and consistency across the entire testing frequency range, where we have an almost sub-2 SWR across 50 MHz. That's pretty impressive. One thing that is interesting is the conductor diameter goes up, the target tuned length goes down, so that an antenna with a larger conductor will also need to be tuned to a smaller than calculated overall length. Test number 7 shows a spectacular 1.17 SWR right on 434 MHz, even though it's a little shorter than the calculated length. We did not run these tests a second time. Because of the odd coupling that was observed when the element diameter was increased, I wanted to run another set of tests, but this time using a large conductor, in this case our 587 inch OD copper pipe, which will remain at a constant length, meaning the overall length will be shorter as the length between the elements gets shorter as well. In test number 2, we can see the SWR and Smith charts are behaving well across the entire 100 MHz sweep. But test 1 and 3 looks like there's either too much capacitance or inductance near the edges of the frequency range. Overall resistance goes down when the length between the elements becomes shorter, but we also pick up some odd transients because of the coupling effect. The next set of tests will change the feed line placement, because sometimes packaging can put the edges of the feed line near the grounding or active element. The transparent video and the VNA are synced up. When the coax cable is situated near the grounded element, we notice a decrease in overall resistance and does not have a huge impact on the antenna. When the coax cable is situated near the active element, we notice a massive increase in resistance and massive increase in inductance near the lower frequency range. This also greatly increases the angle of the SWR. 
It seems if we must route the coax cable near the elements of the antenna, the grounded element is best, but the most reliable results can be found by keeping the coax far away from any element. From the last experiments, I figured we could easily tune the resistance and capacitance of an antenna using a wire connected to the opposing element. It's physically only connected to the top, but routed down near the bottom element. We start with a 22 gauge wire down the full length of the antenna. This causes a massive drop in resistance and a massive capacitance, making the once nicely tuned antenna to have a poor 4.4 SWR. Cutting the coupling wire shorter, we pulled the resistance back up and reduced the capacitive coupling. After some tweaking, we were able to get a 1.05 SWR with reasonable width but I was able to tune this without modifying the location, diameter, or spacing of the antenna elements. That wraps up all the testing, and I'm really happy with all the results. Instead of needing to rely on an antenna tuner or the radio to brute force an antenna into working, we identified a few design principles and effects that we can use to tune and tweak an antenna's design. At least dipole design in the hundreds of megahertz range. I'm not too sure how far this data can be extrapolated. So, really quick, here are the key points that the data supports. First, until the antenna element diameter is larger than the coax feed wire diameter, spacing between the elements has little effect on antenna performance. When the antenna element diameter is larger than the coax, spacing is important. We found that one half the diameter of the element gives a good balance of resistance and capacitance, should be a decent starting point. This was especially true for both the number 4 and the 5 8 copper pipe. Using a larger element diameter gives a wider acceptable range of frequencies to transmit on. This could be important for certain installations. Using a larger element diameter also gives a more consistent result between runs meaning several antennas created using a similar process should have similar or near similar performance. Using a larger element diameter gives a lower resistance, which is easier to fix than too high of a resistance, which requires the use of a ballon. Using a coupling wire can easily allow an antenna to be tuned without moving the elements, but this tuning appears to create a narrower allowable SWR band. The larger element diameter, the smaller overall length the antenna needs to be to be tuned. This gives us quite a list of knobs to turn when designing antennas, and I hope you can use it as well. After lots of digging around the internet, I found many rules of thumb and was told to just trust the math, but never felt that I fully understood why, and the cause and effect that changes would have. After running these tests, I feel that some of the variables we can use to tune antennas are within the control of hobbyists and DIYers alike. I think I'm going to take another try at making that dipole, with these characteristics in mind. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. All of the data with side-by-side -side comparisons are in the spreadsheet in the description as well. And if you've made it this far, you might consider subscribing. The YouTube algorithm thinks that you might enjoy this video that's on the screen right now, so give it a gander if you have a few extra minutes. And as always, get out there and make something in your shop.